If you would, open to Numbers chapter 15 and John chapter 8. <coughs> Numbers chapter 15 and John chapter 8. Are we on? Good. Let's bow our heads in prayer. Father, we do thank you for this time of fellowship. We thank you that we have gathered together, assembled together to receive wisdom and truth, which is found in your word. We pray that this word would go forth with clarity and understanding, rightly divided and anointed of you. We invite you into our presence. Holy Spirit, lead us, guide us, direct us in this word. We give you glory and praise in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Uh, Numbers chapter 15, verse 32, it says, Now while the children of Israel were in the wilderness, they found a man gathering sticks on the Sabbath day. And those who found him gathering sticks brought him to Moses and Aaron and to all the congregation. They put him under guard because it was not been explained what should be done to him. Then the Lord said to Moses, The man must surely be put to death. All the congregation shall stone him with stones outside the camp. So as the Lord commanded, Moses and all the congregation brought him outside the camp and stoned him with stones, and he died. Okay, uh, Just, you know, reading the scripture again, we're on, I think, the third part now on, on salvation. Uh, in our first part, I, I taught you that I believe salvation is a, is a lifelong process here on the earth. Uh, we believe that at the new birth, we deal with the penalty of sin. Uh, we, we get a new recreated spirit, a new spirit. The Holy Spirit comes and lives in us. <coughs> and um, our, our relationship with God is now restored. We become righteous, born again. And then I, I told you that the second part of that, which people miss, is through our life we go through the salvation of the soul, which is really dealing with the power of sin over our life. And then the third part is the resurrection of the body, which is dealing with the probability, making it impossible to sin. And so we see here uh, in, in Numbers that we're, we're, we're still dealing with the penalty of sin. This will be uh, dealing with the penalty of sin. I had you go here because this is probably one of the more interesting judgments that God had. You know, the, the law is so new that they find a man gathering sticks, okay, which means he's going to build a fire. He's not going to build a house. He's going to build a fire or he's going to warm himself. I mean, generally, that's why back then you would gather sticks. And so he's caught doing this on the Sabbath day, which is a disobedience. You're not to work on the Sabbath day. And so this lucky guy who they find gathering sticks on the Sabbath. They don't even know what to do with them. They put him under guard until Moses can go to God to find out what to do to him. And God said, he must surely be put to death. So they took him outside the camp and they stoned him. Interesting, right? But this is, this is what this tells us, that any and all sin is worthy of death. Any sin you commit, thou shalt not lie, worthy of death. Right? Any sin. Any sin is worthy of death. That means that we deserve death practically every day of our life. Okay? So we're dealing, remember what we're doing now. We're dealing with salvation and the penalty of sin. And so a lot of us look at the Bible and we look at the Old Testament and we can't understand why. And, and we really have to understand why. Because if you understand that, that when God looked at this situation, he said, this is what breaking my law requires. You can bring it into perspective in your own life at how much grace and mercy you walk in every day because you know Jesus Christ. Go over to John chapter 8. 
<coughs> John chapter 8. Verse 1, it says, But Jesus went into the Mount of Olives. Now early in the morning, he came again into the temple, and all the people came to him, and he sat down and taught them. The scribes and the Pharisees brought to him a woman caught in adultery, and when they had set her in the midst, they said to him, Teacher, this woman was caught in adultery in the very act. So while she was committing adultery. <coughs> Moses and the law commanded us that we should stone, she should be stoned. But what do you say? This they said, testing him, that they might have something of which to accuse him. But Jesus stooped down and wrote on the ground with his finger as though he did not hear. When they continued asking him, he raised himself up and said to them, He who is without sin among you, let him throw a stone at her first. And again he stooped down and wrote on the ground. Then those that heard it, being convicted by their conscience, went out one by one, beginning with the oldest, even to the last. And Jesus was left alone, and the woman standing in the midst. When Jesus had raised himself up and saw no one but the woman, he said to her, Woman, where are those accusers of yours? Has no one condemned you? She said, No one, Lord. He said to her, Neither do I condemn you. Go and sin no more. Then, spoke, then Jesus spoke to them again, saying, I am the light of the world. He who follows me shall not walk in darkness, but have the light of life. Amen? And so here we see, now understand this. I want you to get a picture in your mind. This woman sinned still under law. Under law, they were right. She was supposed to be stoned to death because he had not paid for sins yet. But Jesus is a reflection of the Father, right? If you've seen me, you've seen the Father. So Jesus is illustrating the church age. He's illustrating grace and mercy. He's illustrating to us what we walk in today. And so when, when you look at what he did here, he, he, he said to her, I'm going to forgive you. And, and this is where a lot of people miss it. You're caught in the very act. You're guilty, right? You, know, you always like to ask, where's the guy in all of this? Because in the very act, there had to be another participant. But he evidently wasn't invited to the stoning or the condemnation. And when you get, when you get down to it, you know, when Jesus wrote in the ground, you know, there's a lot of theories on that. But one of the theories is that he, he let it sink into them. Well, you know, if you should be stoned... You know, I, I probably, you know, I slept with her, I slept with her, or the baker slept with her, whoever slept with her. She, this was her profession, right? So, but what I want you to see here is grace and mercy at work. Jesus said to her, I don't condemn you, okay? Which means I'm forgiving you, because she was condemned already, right? She was sinned, she, she broke the law. He said, I'm not going to condemn you. So what does that mean? He's forgiving her. But then he said what? Go, sin no more. Now everybody had left, but he turns to her and he said, Jesus spoke to them again saying, I am the light of the world. He who follows me shall not walk in darkness, but shall have the light of life. So when we look at this, she deserved death, we deserve death. When we come into this relationship with God by faith, and we want to look at that today, I want to look at how do we move over to the other side of the ledger. When we have that faith and that forgiveness comes into our life, there's a second part to this. Go sin no more and walk in the light as I am in the light. Do you guys see that? And so Jesus is really laying out for us that after forgiveness in dealing with the penalty of sin, because we're going to come back to this in the next weeks when we look at the power of sin, dealing with the penalty of sin, it was dealt with. She now had a clean record to start to follow him and walk with him. And that's what our salvation is. Our salvation is you're alive to us now. And so, you know, you've forgiven us of all of our sins. And now there's an obligation on me to walk in the light as you are in the light and to start what? Walking without sin. Amen. You know, so when you look at the Old Testament, if you go over to... Uh, 
Romans chapter uh, Romans chapter three. You know, when you when you really look at that, also, he gave her the ability then to have a life and a relationship with God that wasn't there before. Even in, in, in her sin, you have to admit. I mean, she's caught in the very act. It's not a it's not an accusation. She sinned. Romans chapter uh, three and verse nineteen. It says, now we know whatsoever the law says. It says to those that are under the law that every mouth may be stopped and all the world may become guilty before God. Therefore, by the deeds of the law, no flesh will be justified in his sight. For by the law is the knowledge of sin. And so we see in the Old Testament, because you you have to understand this. You know, God has this, this frail being, us, man, humanity. And he has, to, he has to reveal to them the condition they're in. So in the Old Testament, because, there was, because there, there was no way to change them from the inside out, there was no way to, to make things right. Even Abraham, when he died, did not go in the presence of God like we do. Because his spirit was dead, okay? Because of the fall, Every man and woman born on the face of the earth is born destined to go to hell and be eternally separated from God. Session one, which we did, right? So so now the law, God gave the law to show man, number one, no one, no one is innocent. Every single person is capable and will sin. So what was that? He gave them a knowledge of sin. He gave them a knowledge of death, saying that all are guilty. No one is justified. But he gave them the ceremonial system called shadow Christology. Again, we talked about it in the first session, where they would take an innocent lamb, and they would take that innocent lamb, and it, you know, I think it was 12 or 15 days old, and they would slaughter that lamb. So innocence would die. I mean... And the kids would get to know the lamb, and the family would get to know the lamb. It was, I mean, when a baby lamb was born in the fold, it was like a, it was like a pet to them, right? They're shepherds. And so they take this lamb, and they would, they would slay this lamb, and this lamb's blood would be representative of what God required. Innocence, innocent shed blood was required to deal with all of the daily sins that we have, even though we're serving God, Okay. So they went through this every year. And Hebrews tells us it wasn't possible for the blood of bulls and goats to take away sins. Okay? So for God to invade our life with the relationship that he wanted to have with us, which Jesus presented to the woman caught in adultery, God had to take on the task of changing us so that he could have a relationship with us and we didn't have to go through that process anymore, okay? So we learned that man is unrighteous. So Abraham believed God, and it was accounted to him for righteousness. Moses believed God and obeyed the law, and it was accounted to him for righteousness. So because they believed in the process of shadow Christology out of the law, they got to participate in a type of salvation in the Old Testament. Even though their sins weren't completely gone, they were just put aside or atoned, they weren't right with God still. So God couldn't deal with them still the way he can deal with us today. Okay? So when you look at where we're at, God produced the righteousness in Jesus Christ. And again, if you weren't here for the other sessions, I mean, we, we talked about it how God produced in Jesus Christ by bringing the Lamb of God born outside of Adam's transgression. So he was without sin, right? He was born righteous. He was holy. He lived his life without sin. And then at the appointed time, he was turned over to sinners to be falsely judged. Last week we looked at Isaiah chapter 53. He was hung on a cross... In your sins, my sins, your iniquities, my iniquities, our transgressions, our guilt, our shame, and everything that we were guilty of, past, present, and future, 
by faith were forgiven in the eyes of God. Okay? So, so when you read on now, we just read how the law brings what? It brings us a knowledge of sin. It makes us guilty, right? Because now we know. We, we can't, everybody's going to sin. Thou shalt not lie. You know, tell them I'm not home. It's a lie. Your cookies taste great. It's a lie, right? So, verse 21. But now the righteousness of God. So it's the righteous, not the righteousness of man, but the righteousness of God apart from the law is revealed, being witnessed by the law and the prophets, even the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ. So we get or receive the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ to all and on all who believe, for there is no difference. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, being justified freely by his grace. So being justified freely by his grace. Justified means the court case is closed. It's dismissed. Your condemnation is over. It's been appealed and it's gone. Being justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God set forth as a propitiation by his blood through faith to demonstrate his righteousness because in his forbearance, God had passed over the sins that were previously committed to demonstrate at the present time his righteousness that he might be just, and listen, and the justifier of the one who has faith in Christ, in Jesus. Now look at that last verse. It says that he might be just. So God had to put together a plan that would stand up to the scrutiny of the devil and all the fallen angels. And that's why Jesus had to pay the price he did. In other words, God had to be just to justify you and me. God had to, to pay a price through his son that would accomplish us becoming righteous. Now the Bible tells us that we are the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. I think we looked at it last week in, in 2 Corinthians. We are as righteous as God is on the day of our new birth. Okay, so when, you be, when you become born again, your spirit now is alive unto God and the Holy Spirit comes to live in you. And the only way that happens is because you are as righteous as God is because there's no way he could cohabitate in you. Do you follow? So at the new birth we see that sin is addressed. The penalty of sin is addressed. The penalty, which really would be your, your, your eternal death, is done away with because of your faith in Jesus Christ. And we looked at that last week, but I really want to bring it to the surface today. You're in Romans. Go over to Romans chapter 10. It says, but what does it say? The word is near you, verse 8, in your mouth and in your heart, that is the word of faith which we preach, that if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart one believes unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. For the scripture says, whosoever believes in him will not be put to shame. And so we see here that it starts in the heart. We see in three verses what's in the heart. You know, the word is nigh thee, even in thy heart first, and then in thy mouth, that if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus to glorify him and believe where? In your heart. So the belief has to be there first. You will be saved. For with the heart man believes unto righteousness, but with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. So really what this is saying is, your mouth is responding to what you have faith for inside of you. And it's not your head, it's your heart. I'm going to try to illustrate that to you. Because there's a difference between your head and your heart. Okay? And, and, and so, but we see here, 
that this is the prayer. People use this as a prayer. You know, repeat after me. You know, and they go through the whole process of, of this prayer of confessing Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. And, and, and you can do that or you can, you can bring in the elements of this, just like the Our Father. You know, he didn't want us to just repeat it all the time. It's a framework of how to pray. You know, you give God praise first. You know, you set his name apart. You know, you, you, you ask requests in your life. You pray the kingdom of God in your life and the life around. Well, here it's confess with your mouth that the Lord Jesus, and you believe in your heart that he is Lord, okay? That you've, you've set him apart from everyone else as the Lord of your life. When you make that confession, you're saying, Jesus, you are the Lord of my life. I make you the Lord of my life, which means I submit every breath and every minute to you, your word, and your will. Okay? So that's what you're doing. Okay, let's take a look at sin. Go back to Genesis chapter 3. <laughs> Genesis chapter 3. Let's look at verse 2, verse 15. It says, Then the Lord God took the man, put him in the garden of Eden to keep, dress it and to keep it, tend it and keep it. And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, Of every tree of the garden thou mayest eat, freely eat, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat, for in the day that you eat of it you shall, what, surely die. So there's very clear here, there's a commandment, similar to the guy that gathered sticks, right? Thou shalt not work on the Sabbath day, right? Very clear, very plain, no gray area. Uh, there's no wiggle room here. Chapter 3 and verse 1. It says, Now the serpent was more cunning than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said to the woman, Has God indeed said, You shall not eat of every tree of the garden? And the woman said to the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden, but of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the middle of the garden, God has said, You shall not eat of it, nor shall you touch it, lest you die. The serpent said to the woman, You shall not surely die, for God knows that in the day that you eat, your eyes shall be opened, and you will be like God's, knowing good and evil. So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, it was Pleasant to the eye, a tree to be desired to make one wise. She took of the fruit and did eat and ate. She also gave to her husband with her and he did eat. Okay? And the eyes of them both were open. We see the first sin here, but I want you to see this. I, wa I want you to understand this and, and really get this into your spirit. What happened here? God gave a commandment. It was very clear what the consequences would be. Satan comes in. And he says two things, which if you've been here, coming here, we've been really honing in on this. Satan said, you shall not surely die. There's no consequence to your actions. There's no effect to your wrong. There's no harm to your foul. You can live the way you want to live. You can do what you want without what? Fear of God. So you don't have to fear God. Second thing he said is, You'll be as God's now determining what's good and evil. So now you'll be like God and make the laws for yourself. Okay? So what is he really saying? He's saying you don't need to glorify God as God. You don't need to glorify God as the creator of everything and having authority over everything to determine what's right and wrong with his creation. And you don't have to fear God or glorify God as the judge. So you don't have to glorify God as the creator, as the authority and manager to put laws in place that govern his creation, and as the judge over his creation. So once you move God down and you act on your own, you now have put everything else above God and you don't glorify him as God. So they acted without fear. They acted without thinking there was a consequence. Acted as if nothing was going to happen to them. And acted as if they created it. Right? Because they acted against the creator. Right? And so when you look at this, 
This is what the fall of man did to man. The fall of man told man, you can make your own rules, you can set in place your own goals and projects and, 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 and laws that you live by and the rules that you live by and the consequences you live by. And now when you move God down and you move yourself up, you're lost, you're condemned. Salvation is bringing Jesus Christ to a place of glorification in your life. It's now restoring him as God the creator, God the authority over creation, and God the judge over creation. It's bringing him back to a status where you glorify him with your life. You're saying, I know I'm a sinner. I know I commit sin. But Lord Jesus, I know you paid for my sins, and therefore I'm committing and submitting my life to you to live for you. That's what brings us to new birth. Okay? And what happens is we move over to the other side of the ledger. And now we have to live a life glorifying him and beating sin out of our life, which we'll take up next week and the week after that. Okay? But I want, to, I want you to see what this active living faith is, because the Bible says a lot about it. You know, a lot of people make this a prayer in a parking lot. A lot of people make this a simple prayer. It's, it, there is a conception to the new birth. Where, you're, where your spirit is made alive, and now you're, you're, you're conceived into the body of Christ. But there's a growth that goes with that. We have to understand what that word believe means, or faith means, okay? So I want to look at a couple of scriptures. Go over to James chapter 2. James chapter 2. Verse 14, it says, What does it profit, my brethren, if someone says he has faith but does not have works? Can faith save him? Okay, so here there's a series of questions. What does it profit, my brethren, if someone says they have faith? What is he saying? Says they have faith in Jesus Christ as Lord says they have faith that he is Lord and he's going to follow the, his word, right, and submit to him. But he has not works. Can faith save him? In other words, can his faith save him? Or he's, it's all lip service. If a brother or sister is naked and destitute of daily food, and one of you says to them, depart in peace, be warmed and filled, but you do, you, you do not give them the things which are needed for the body, what does it profit? Thus also, faith by itself, if it does not have works, is dead. But Now listen, what, you have to understand what dead is. Dead means what? Lifeless. There's no life to the faith. faith it's, it's, there is no faith. Okay? It says, but, but someone will say, you have faith and I have works. Show me your faith without your works, and I will show you my faith by my works. You believe that there is one God, you do well. Even the demons believe and tremble. But do you want to know, O oh foolish man, that faith without works is dead? Now, he says a lot here, and he's trying to make a point, but I want you to see something. He said the devil knows God exists. Knowing God exists doesn't get you salvation. Amen. Knowing Jesus exists doesn't give you salvation. You're going to see that in our next scripture. So he's saying that your faith have to have the right thing attached to it, actions. You have to have actions, actionable evidence that tells the world and yourself that you truly believe so that it begins to change your step and your walk in the earth. That's what James is saying. James is saying you can say all day long, praise the Lord, I love Jesus, Praise his name. If there's no actions, there's no faith. If there's no faith, there's no salvation. Do you get it? So, so he goes on. We might as well finish it up. I think it's funny how he brings the devil in there. In other words, somebody that can't possibly get saved knows God exists and Jesus exists. 
that doesn't get you there. That's not the home run. That's the, that you're still in the dugout. It says, was not Abraham our father justified by works when he offered Isaac his son on the altar? Do you see that faith was working together with his works and by works was faith made what? Perfect. So now we go from dead faith to perfect faith, which is what acting on what God said. What did Abraham do when he offered his son on the altar? He obeyed God's word. God said, offer your son up. He obeyed God's word. So what was that? That's an actionable faith, okay? Remember in the first series, we taught on you must bear fruit. Fruit is action. We'll close with that tonight. He says in the scripture, verse 23, and the scripture was fulfilled, which says Abraham believed God and it was accounted to him for righteousness. And he was called the friend of God. You see then that a man is justified by works and not by faith only. Likewise, was not Rahab the harlot also justified by works when she received the messenger and sent them out another way? For as the body without the spirit is dead, so faith without works is dead also. What can a dead body produce? Nothing. Nothing. Okay? He's making a point. If you go over to Matthew chapter 7, In verse 21, it says, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father in heaven. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name, and in thy name cast out demons, in thy name done many wonderful works in your name? And then I will declare to them, I never knew you, Depart from me, you practice of you, you who practice lawlessness. Therefore, whosoever hears these sayings of mine and what does them, has the action to do them. I will liken them unto a wise man who builds his house on a rock. The rains descend, the floods came, the winds blew, and it beat on that house, and it did not fall, for it was founded on a rock. But everyone who hears these sayings of mine and does not do them, will be likened unto a foolish man who builds his house on the sand, the runs, rains descend, the floods came, the winds blew, beat upon the house and it fell, and great was the fall of it. And here we have people basically going through life deceived, thinking they had eternal security. They had a relationship with God in their mind only. Their intentions were probably good, but they made assumptions through their life that they were good with God and God was going to follow them. Okay? So clearly what was missing was hearing the word and doing the word. Clearly it was not lip service. It wasn't even believing Jesus is real. They called him Lord, Lord. What they didn't do is they didn't glorify him as God, glorify him as the creator, glorify him as having authority over creation. It means that he has authority over my life and your life. So that we, when we commit to him as Lord and Savior, we have to walk in his word and become more obedient as we walk in this life. We don't start out knowing which end of the pencil to write with, but we learn the way through growing in the word of God and then walking it out. Amen? Amen. And so with Jesus, when he said, I never knew you, it means I don't, have, I don't even have a clue as to why you're even talking to me. Don't even have a clue as to why you're talking to me. Because you and me have nothing. How would you like to live your whole life and face Jesus on the day you die and have him say that to you? And you're trying to make excuses about what you did. Think about, think about their sin. They're telling him what they did for him in the earth. They had no right to do that. If they glorified him as God, as their Savior, and understood the salvation gospel plan, all they could do is thank him for what he did. Everything else is meaningless. Do you see how their mind was, 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 was messed up? How they didn't glorify him as God? I mean, the last thing you do when you face Jesus Christ at your death or at the rapture 
is tell him, didn't I teach for 25 years? Didn't I do this? No. It's thank you, Lord, for what you did for me. Just thank you for giving me the life. Thank you for dying for me. Thank you for taking my sins. Thank you for making me righteous, giving me eternal life. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. It's not look at me. You know, and Jesus goes to, to real extents. If you go over to John, go over to John 14. Verse 15, if you love me, keep my commandments. Verse 21, he who has my commandments and keeps them, it is he who loves me. And he who loves me will be loved of my father, and I will love him and manifest myself to him. Do you guys see that? Verse 23, Jesus answered and said to them, if any man loves me, he will keep my word. And my father will love him and we will come to him and make our home where with him he who does not love me does not keep my words and the words which you hear is not mine but the father who sent me amen so do you, do you guys see that what i mean he's saying listen if you really love me you're going to listen to me i know what's best for you right now i want to i want to go i want you to look at two things here i want you to look at Go to John chapter 6. Well, no, go to John 12 first. I want you to look at... John 12, verse 1. Then six days before the Passover, it's significant prophetically, it says, Jesus came to Bethany where Lazarus, who had been dead, whom he had raised from the dead... And there they made him a supper, and Martha served, but Lazarus was one who sat with him. And Mary took a pound of very costly oil of spikenard, anointed the feet of Jesus, wiped his feet with her hair, and the house was filled with the fragrance of the oil. And as one of his disciples, Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, who would betray him, said, why was this fragment uh, or fragrant oil not sold for 300 denarii, which is a year's wages, and given to the poor? This he said, not that he cared for the poor, but because he was a thief and had the money box, and he used to take what was, was put in it. Jesus said, let her alone. She has kept this for the day of my burial, for the poor you have with you always, but me you do not have always. Okay, I want you to see, go over to John 6 now, but I want you to look at what Judas was saying here. Because I'm doing a series, the next curriculum we're doing is on, on this, on what we're doing now, is, is, is self-deception and true salvation. And I'm going to highlight the two apostles through the ten parts, just pieces of them as we go through. But, I mean, here we have Judas. Now, now remember, Judas and Peter had the same pastor, the same teacher, witnessed the same anointing, seen the same miracles. They had church every day. When Jesus walked on water, Lazarus, you know, I mean, Judas seen it. When he raised, you know, somebody from the dead, he's seen it. Judas seen it. Judas seen him take the fish and multiply. He's seen all the miracles, okay? After all of that, at the end, She's preparing for his burial. We're at the end. We're deep in his life now, okay? We're getting close to the crucifixion. He, he questions money spent on Jesus. He didn't glorify him at all. Do you guys see that? He questioned, why are you wasting this money on him? Let it hurt you in your heart. Think about it. You know, I mean, think about that. This guy went to church every day. And when it came time for a lineup, one of you is going to betray me. No one picked him out. Think about that. Now look at Peter's heart. Go to John chapter 6.
verse 61, it says, Jesus knew in himself that his disciples complained about this, and he said to them, let me explain. He just got done teaching, you must eat my body and drink my blood. Okay, so he's talking about communion. He says, does this offend you? Verse 62, what then if you should see the Son of Man ascend where he was before? It is the Spirit who gives life, the flesh profits nothing. The words that I speak to you are spirit and they are life. In other words, they're not flesh. I'm not talking about flesh and blood. I'm talking about something spiritual. But there are some of you who do not believe. For Jesus knew from the beginning who they were that did not believe and who would betray him. And he said, Therefore have I said unto you that no one can come to me unless it was granted him by my Father. From that time, many disciples went back and walked with him no more. Okay, they were offended at it. Then Jesus said to the twelve, Do you also want to go away? You know, two good scriptures if you want to go into Christian leadership. The rich young ruler, don't worry about his check. Tell him the truth, right? And here, if you're offended by the word, go ahead. What can I tell you? You can leave, right? But Simon Peter, listen to Simon Peter's answers. Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. Also, we have come to believe and know that you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. Then Jesus answered them, Did I not choose you twelve, and one of you is a devil? He spoke of Judas Iscariot, the son of Simon, for it was he who would betray him, being one of the twelve. Do you guys see Peter's heart? I don't understand it, but I'm not leaving. I'm not going anywhere. You're the guy. He glorified him. Okay, That's the same thing in our lives. It's a, look at the per, people in the pews and the seats next to you at church on Sunday. It's, it, you know, who will be a great Christian is one who glorifies him the most and walks in his word the most and suffers for him the most. Who will be a mediocre Christian? Those that, that, that straddle the two worlds. And then those that go, just lip service, just lip service. You have to bear fruit. Understand something. It's not an experience it's not just the conception. The salvation has to grow. This is where the church has it wrong today. They, they believe that people come to the altar and they say a prayer and it locks them in for eternity. It's one of the most dangerous doctrines today in the church is once saved, always saved, because it doesn't make you accountable to your covenant partner at all. You, you, Jesus said it. Go to John 15 and we'll close there. John 15, I am the true vine and my father is the dresser. Verse 1. My father is the vine dresser. Every branch in me, notice he's the vine, so every branch growing out of the vine in him, so there's a relationship that does not bear fruit, what does he do? He takes it away. And every branch that bears fruit, he prunes it. He cuts it back. He, he, you know, he frustrates it. He, he cuts off its life. I mean, when you prune a rose bush, I think I told you when I taught on this, my mother-in-law took these beautiful rose bushes that were like waist high, and they were little stubs when I came home. I said, your mother, Chris, your mother killed the rose bushes. And sure enough, they got bigger the next year because they grow back. That's how they, that's how, that's what happens. They get stronger. So God cuts off. And what does he cut off? He cuts off our pride. He cuts off our glory for ourselves. He cuts off our selfishness. He cuts off our self-centeredness. He cuts off us walking in sin. So as he chops that away and frustrates us, he prunes us back because he takes away our, our what we consider to be our life and strips us so we can grow back stronger, okay? He says, you are already clean because of the words which I have spoken to you. Abide, and we learned in the first session, abide doesn't mean you visit. Abide means you live there. Abide in me, live there 24-7 in me in a relationship with me and I in you, as the branch cannot bear fruit of itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. 
I am the vine and you are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him bears much fruit. So we go from fruit to more fruit to much fruit. For without me you can do nothing. If anyone does not abide in me, they leave. He is cast out as a branch and is withered. And they gather them and throw them into the fire and they are burned. If you abide in me and my words abide in you, you will ask what you desire and it shall be done for you. By this is my father, what? Glorified that you bear much fruit. So you will be my disciples. Now remember in the Bible, there's believers which visit. Believers are the guys that, you know, they come once a month, maybe, maybe Christmas, Easter, whatever. Then there's, there's followers. These are people that are more committed. And then there's disciplined believers. Disciplined believers are what we should aspire to be, but disciplined believers are what Jesus is looking for. They're disciplined in their walk. As my Father loved me, I also have loved you. Abide in my love. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love. Just as I have, I have kept my Father's commandments, and abide in, in his love. Amen? And so you, you see here, there's no way to gray this up. God's expectation is that your life in Jesus Christ produces actions that reflect him and his word. So that as you walk through this life, someone can tell that you're just not another human being, but you're a true believer in Jesus Christ. There shouldn't be any guesswork. They should see you and know. You should be a forgiver of people. You should be a giver, not a, not a taker. You should be, you know, a, a loving, compassionate, a teaching person, meek, the fruit of the Spirit, love, joy, meekness, right? Long-suffering, gentle, kindness. These are the fruits of Jesus Christ. The Bible tells us that that's how tall we are in Christianity. It's not this teaching gift doesn't make me higher in rank in heaven. Love makes us higher in rank in heaven. He said, if you, if you don't love me, you're like an out-of-tune musical instrument. He said, you can have all the faith in the world. If you don't have love, it doesn't matter. You can give your body to be martyred, and it doesn't matter if you don't walk in love. Love, 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 right? So this we're, gonna, we're done with the with the dealing with the penalty of sin, but I want you to see so you can understand that when you talk to somebody about salvation, you're making a commitment for life. And the next phase of that is you have to glorify God. And we're going to, next week we'll start this by continuing in what you know and growing and adding to what you know so that you walk stronger and stronger and stronger and you become a force and a light in the world. Amen. And, 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 and then the final piece of that is, because when is our salvation sealed? When we die. To be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. When's it complete? The re with the resurrection, the new body. Okay? Three phases. Penalty of sin, the power of sin, and dealing with the probability of future sin. Okay? Let's bow our heads in prayer. Father, we thank you for today, Lord God. We thank you for a couple of prayer requests. We thank you for a blessing for a new uh, great-grandson, for Dwayne. We pray that mother and child wax strong, grow strong. We pray that you'd bless the family, Lord God, and cause this child, this son, to grow up, Father, to know you, that your hand would be upon him, even from the womb, that, Father, you would teach him and raise him, Father, and watch over him and bring him, not only through physical growth, but also spiritual growth, that he would wax strong in the spirit and grow to serve you, Father, even to another generation. Father, we pray for law enforcement in our country, and we pray for unity in our country, Lord God, as there's several and great divisions, Father, in our nation, Father, as we're, we're seeing it play out. Lord, we pray over law enforcement, God. We pray that you would protect them, that you would give them favor, Lord God, that you would, Father, intercede in situations that could spark into an ugly situation. And Father, we pray, God, that the demon of strife and division 
that is trying to divide our nation based on color again, Lord God. We come against that demonic spirit in the name of Jesus, and we command it to stand down. Lord God, we pray that you would dispatch angels across this land to preserve and protect the unity of this nation, Lord God. And Father, we pray, Lord God, that there be revival in the land. And revival starts with us, Lord God. We pray for a revival, Lord God, of loving your word and growing in your word, leaving the church of entertainment and moving to a church which teaches, Father, foundational principles based on your word. Lord God, we pray, Father, for a moving of your spirit in this nation, that men and women that know you and know your word, that have spent years preparing, Lord God, that you would break out in their lives, God, through healings and deliverances, that your grace and mercy would flow from them, Father, to manifest your name and to bring glory and praise to your church and to your name, Jesus, to your body. We give you glory and praise and honor. We love you so much. We thank you, Lord Jesus, in Jesus' name, amen. Teach this Saturday at our new place over on Hayes, Ninth Victory, which is on 19 in Hayes. It's right across from Tim Hortons. Uh, it's uh, Victory Christian Church, and we've been there now. We're going to be there every first and third Saturday, and uh, you know we.